You're listening to Science Coast with Mallory Havens and Chris White and our guest Dominic Colonna. We're going to talk today about a letter that the Pope released uh, back in October, October 2023, uh, Laudate Diem, and I'm sure I'll, my pronunciations get corrected at some point. Uh, the Pope is known, Pope Francis, the Holy Father, is known as an environmentalist, and he has in the past released lots of information about how he believes that uh, climate change is real and is man-made and has been encouraging the faithful to actually act and do something. So about seven, eight years ago, he released his original document where he was calling on all people of faith to do something about the climate, to do something about the planet. And then so in October, he got a little frustrated because he has not seen sufficient action and the way that I often phrase it is he's, he's yelling at us saying, were you not listening to me? This is a real problem that we need to address. And I call upon all people of faith to get off your butts and start doing things. So I think it would be a really interesting conversation today uh, with Dominic to, to explore this document. You know, in a, in a past podcast, we talked about the relationship between science and faith. And an obvious question comes to mind. What, um, what are the credentials that the Pope has, or even um, anybody who helps the Pope, to speak on issues of science? And uh, Chris referred to Laudato um, C, uh, a document that was published in 2015. Officially, that's a letter, an encyclical letter. And, and it has a certain hierarchy of value, and that was a little bit more important than the document we're talking about now which is an apostolic exhortation. So, and, <laughs> but, but the idea is that the, you know, there's, a, there's a value over the years, which are most important, which are direct rules, which will filter down to required activities. So at one point, Chris used the word encourage. This is way more than encourage. This is an exhortation, and as you said, um, a, a frustration. And the initial letter, Laudato Si, was addressed to all people. This one is addressed to all people of goodwill. Um, recognizing that um, in, initially he tried to throw the, the net out wide. Now he's just going to those people who's, who are willing to listen. So when – is this just something that gets published in – I don't know where the Pope publishes things. Like obviously he doesn't mail a letter to everyone. Obviously this is released in some way. But how, how is this supposed to reach all good people? I think it's like a press release in some sense. And I found out about it a day or after it was published um, just from my, my, my media feeds. Mm. So I was just going through my media feeds, and then there was an article in Reuters or some other place saying, hey, the Pope just released this. And, and so I went and I read it, and I was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a resident non-Catholic who likes to fill in for all those other people out there that don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was not in the, in the Catholic press. This was in the regular media and, yeah. and so people were reporting on it. When, when the Holy Father um, makes statements, you know, for example, recently uh, he made a statement that it would be okay to um, have, to bless a, a same-sex couple. They're not getting married in the church, but basically he said it'd be okay. So that, that made news internationally right. because the Pope said something. And, and I think this is a similar situation where the, the Pope is calling on all people of good faith uh, to act, to do something. And, um, and so the media, the, the non-Catholic media is picking up on it because he is a figure. He is an international figure. Yeah, for sure. You know, Mallory, just to get back quickly, in the past, these were distributed to bishops. So an encyclical letter was one that was circulated, so that would be the route, to the bishops, and then they would talk to, they would communicate to their, uh, the people in their care. Now, though, with modern media since the 20th century, these could be published in ways that everybody could ac have access to them. I'm old enough to remember as a graduate student being frustrated because I knew there was a letter out there, but we didn't have internet access to it. So I had to wait for a publication mm. to print the letter and then it would make a photocopy and then they would, they would publish it and, and so forth. Now it's available instantaneously on the Vatican website. They have a separate section for all these documents and they make a distinction about their, their authority. So the thing I thought was interesting, one of the things I thought was interesting, there were so many things that are interesting within this document, um, is the Pope is specifically calling out the Western world and, and calling out the United States as uh, consumers and, and basically saying your consumption levels 
are one of the primary drivers for environmental degradation. And as the wealthiest countries of the world, you have more responsibility than the poor nations of the world to try to address the problems that we are primarily driving. Does he cite sources in his letters? I was just going to look them up. Yeah, his major source is um, the work of the United Nations, the uh, Council of the IP. CC. Let's see. If I, I love this for the Pope. I didn't know that he cited stuff. I, oh yeah. This is well, great. he has his own scientists, and um, in the fact, Pope employs scientists. Oh yeah. So the what? Pope, for example, the the head of the um, uh, uh, the Vatican Observatory was actually here on campus a couple of years back. So he's a PhD astrophysicist, and and the you know the Vatican has uh, an observatory where they have PhD astrophysicists doing astrophysical research. And this is just one area where the Pope has access. I mean, the Jesuits, for example, are renowned scientists. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the whole um, concept of the Big Bang Theory was a Catholic priest who initially proposed that the universe started, you know, from a cosmic seed, as they refer to it. So there are lots and lots of scientists who are also ordained priests who uh, the Pope has access to, but he also just looks at all the other data that's been published. So the documents, you know, um, that, that he has are very well uh, referenced. So if you go to the end, there's this big, long bibliography, which lists all the sources saying, this is where I'm getting my information from, just that's as great. any scientific paper would be. I love that. Yeah, you know, um, in the, I mean, historically, despite the Galileo affair, where everybody thinks that there was... Um, and there was, in that case, um, there was a condemnation of new scientific ideas, but many people would say that had to do with politics, internal church politics, and perhaps um, regional politics as well. Um, but there's no denying that the church um, oppressed or suppressed uh, an important new idea. But that idea had been around for a while. And any, any of these people, like Copernicus or Kepler, were Catholics at the time who were promoting an idea, Galileo himself too. Um, there has been, um, in recent times, Chris is referring to a, a pontifical academy of science. And in some ways, there are honorific um, members, but they also will weigh in. I think the source for this is really, really rooted. Um, there are many footnotes, as you mentioned, Chris, but it mostly focuses on the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the reports that it's put out most recently. And this is a panel that is, um, it has about 198 country uh, members who, who um, have scientists voluntarily provide information to, to sift through what, what is true and what's not true about climate change. So what does the Pope want us to do? Well, you know, the Pope is really, you know, he took the name Francis because of his admiration, although he is a Jesuit, and that's a type of um, religious community. He, he liked the community of the Franciscans because St. Francis is known for somebody who was interested in the environment. He has a famous canticle where he prays to the sun and the moon as if they were brother and sister. They are not resources to be, um, to be consumed. So a classic... Um, a classic thing, uh, a text, biblical text is uh, Genesis, I think it's chapter 1, verse 28, that suggests that, that humans, after the creation, were supposed to um, have dominion over the world. And that term has suggested that we use those things for our benefit. And in this document, uh, Francis recognizes that the church does teach that it believes that the human person probably is at the apex of all of creation. Yet at the same time, with evolutionary theory, it recognizes that there's an interconnectedness that, um, that is absolutely essential. So there's a little bit of conflict there in claiming that humans are more special than the rest of creation. But he's taking that Franciscan idea that everything is connected and we have to love and, um, and nurture everything. So the phrase that I often think about is care for creation. It's, uh, you know, we have an obligation, and, and, and uh, Pope Francis is reminding us that we have an obligation to care for the creation, God's creation, and specifically the earth, and is reminding us that our current lifestyles are um, polluting the, the planet, are causing massive uh, levels, you know, unprecedented levels of extinctions of other animals, and that, you know, to what Dominic was saying, we can't ignore the fact that our actions are having harm on other living entities. 
um, and that we can't place ourselves in a, in, a, in, a, in a place where we say that it's irrelevant. Um, the other part about it is we have to think about the future. What are we doing and what price are future generations going to have to pay for our behavior today? And as a Catholic, can I knowingly continue a behavior that I know is hurting other human beings? Regardless of, you know, whether it's also hurting the planet, the argument that I just made, as is my lifestyle, is my consumption, is my, are my conveniences actually infringing upon somebody else's right to have a clean, clean health water, for yeah. example, correct. And, and so I think that there's been a lot of, I don't know if willful ignorance is, is uh, appropriate, but there's been a lot of, I didn't realize Sure. I don't think people are fully aware of the consequences of many of the conveniences that we've learned to enjoy, um, that there's actually a cost that has to be paid later for the convenience that we experience today and now. I think a good example, what I try to do when I'm training students, or I used to work in a pharmaceutical company training scientists, is if you don't tell a person why they're doing something, they can't do it properly. So a good example is if you ask somebody for water and they bring you a glass of water and you go, why did you bring me this? The room's on fire. If you don't tell them why they're doing the action, they don't have the proper way to do it or the motivation. So I think if you phrase it like instead of just being like you should recycle or you should, you know, not consume as much. If you don't say the why, people don't really understand. So, for example, I didn't know that the main reason you don't throw out batteries is they can start fires and trash. Like I, <laughs> that's one, that's p- potentially one reason. Yeah, that is one reason. And I was just, you know, I thought it was bad for the environment and that it could have consequences. But then I saw this thing that's like, no, if you throw out lithium ion batteries, they can set the trash on fire and release all these toxic chemicals and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's the best reason I've heard to actually recycle batteries. Right. And, and this is where I think, you know, a, a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. Um, and for example, I've been recently reading about how, the existing recycling processes for plastics released large quantities of nanoplastics into the waterways. It's like, oh, great. So, you know, we've been sold on this whole notion of recycling, but the process of recycling also creates environmental damage. Right. So, so it's like, great, now what do we do? Um, and, and I think this whole notion of education is part of what we're supposed to be doing. So when, you know, uh, Pope Francis says, hey, you know, we need to start acting. And there's many different things that can happen. And uh, the, the Diocese of Joliet actually released an action plan uh, where they, they have, I think, seven different categories where they say, here are diff- seven different categories where people who are interested, people of goodwill who want to contribute to making the world a better place, um, can take action. And many of them are associated with education, um, educating teachers uh, so that they can educate uh, the young people about what the challenges are, um, but then also issues associated with, you know, looking at your consumption and asking, do I really need to consume all of this? Um, Or are there ways that I can reduce my footprint? And I think that's one of the ways that people often think about their impact is how big of a footprint do you have? Can I reduce my footprint? Um, But ultimately, as a, as a, as a faculty member at a university, I really want to lean into the whole education and awareness um, because then the more people that are aware that there's an issue and that everybody needs to act and that the tra- trajectory that we're on is not sustainable and that simply being more, um, you know, more, more conscious about recycling and being better at recycling isn't going to fix the problem. Yeah, you know, um, th- there, there are comments about that at the end of this document. Chris, you and I have talked about this uh, publicly and privately about encouraging people individually to make an effort um, to, to, to respond to the climate crisis. And um, I think he even uses, the Pope uses the phrase, every little bit counts. A central theme, though, in both of these documents, Laudato Si and then Laudate Deum, is that um, he thinks there has to be um, a shift in the way we think about technology and he, he recognizes, I think, very astutely that the problem is um, economics. You said before, what price do we pay, Chris, when you're referring to um, the, 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 the costs of climate change? And he, he actually um, started an initiative where um, he has younger people working to develop new models of um, economics to, to, to try to persuade world powers to change the way um, they look at technology. 
for him, we live in a technocratic paradigm where, um, where we believe that technology is only something good that will bring us, bring us to greater places without recognizing that technology can also um, can cause the death of, of, the, of the human race. So um, in some ways, he gets a little sticky because he, he talks about the sciences, the natural sciences, but he's really talking about the social sciences too and a need to raise awareness by these individual things so that we can make structural changes internationally. And that's where I think some people might push back on his, his proposals. He gets a little political there. Well, it's, it's, you know, change. Nobody wants to change. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also one of those things where sometimes it's the right thing to do, even though you feel like the price is worth it. So when my five-year-old wants something and he'll be like, well, what's the punishment? Nah. Or I'll do that. And I'm <laughs> Just like... Just the calculation. Yeah, I mean, I used to do that as a kid, too. And I'm like, no, you're not... You, it doesn't matter what the punishment is. It, you're not going to bargain and pay that cost. It's the right thing to do. So that's why you're going to do it. So that's kind of maybe how people need to start looking at stuff like this in climate change or the crisis is not just, oh, if I consume this, what's the impact down the road, but also have like a moral driven, it's just the right thing to do. So you can't say, eh, one life, it's fine. So, so structurally and internationally, it seems that the big challenge is whenever these meetings, the, I think it's called the Conference of Parties, um, where they try to determine new plans um, internationally for how to address climate change, the two themes seem to always be, one, compensation for those peoples who have suffered because of the, 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 the countries and the peoples who have benefited from um, um, the kinds of things that cause pollution, the technology that cause pollution. And that's an economic issue. Who wants to give money um, to, you know, there was a commitment and there's only about a tenth of the money that was promised that's actually been put up. The other thing is to make changes in the future that would cause a lowering of the overall um, temperature of the, of the world. So um, that would mean using different resources, particularly um, not using f um, fossil fuels. It's like the modern day paying for your indulgences. <laughs> where you can just do well, whatever you we'll, want as we'll long have as you another pay. podcast on that <laughs> <laughs> be like i'll just pay the countries i ruined with my consumerism and with that the views thoughts and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and do not represent the views thoughts and opinions of lewis university the material and information presented here is for general information purposes only. The Lewis University name and all forms and abbreviations are the property of its owner and its use does not imply endorsement of or opposition to any specific organization, product, or service. This podcast was produced in the WLRA podcast studios at Lewis University. Visit lewisu.edu for more information about Lewis University. This has been Science Coast with Mallory Havens and Chris, Chris White and Dominic Colonna. Thanks. Bye.